Today's COVID update is brought to you by Fulltech Systems, your technology center, where you'll come for the price, but stay for the service. And welcome back. We are about to get into our first conversation of the morning, and we have with us online via Zoom, Dr. Steven Su. He is in Texas, but the conversation this morning is pretty much relative to Belize and all other parts of the world, which has to do with COVID-19. Good morning, Dr. Sue. Good morning, Isani. Good morning, Marlene. How are you doing? Man, we Thanks are great. We are great. Let's begin, first of all, by getting your uh, professional overview of the COVID-19 situation, both in the United States where you are and perhaps your observation of what is happening here in Belize in terms of our our present state of affairs yes uh well thank you and so let me start out by saying that uh, we have been dealing with this for almost a year yeah. uh and this past week marked the one year since the first case yeah. that has been discovered in the united states uh, at the beginning we we really start out by having um the whole system start activating but it's kind of a, a rush back in march uh, we didn't have enough testing, the PPE was in question, and we have very sick people to begin with. Um, and at that time, I think Belize was doing a, a very good job back then to have the high alert as a system in the country so that um, you did not feel that first wave hit. Um, I think as a whole world, we were, we were more vigilant back then mm -hmm. as opposed to be here in the United States. Uh, folks were initially observing the and adhere to the guidelines. However, that kind of falls short uh, within a month or two due to economic, political reasons. And so we were, we were suffering quite a bit. And at the very beginning, although people might have not seen those waves, but uh, we, we are in the ICU. Uh, I'm at the ICU here at Texas Medical Center, which is the largest in the world. Mm -hmm. And I have seen uh, a full COVID ICU uh, since March. And until this very day, we are still going through all the waves and we're in the thick of the third waves right now, uh, which has been a bit quite, quite detrimental in, the, in terms of a mental morale uh, for all the healthcare status uh, here in the United States. And what I'm in the Belize as well, and, and also unfortunately, we also seen the, the waves that has come by um, due to uh, sort of, the, sort of the, the lax in terms of the adherence to the guidelines as well. And this is not uncommon uh, yeah. in the in the U.S. We have seen recently a study of over 7,000 uh, folks across the United States that uh, at the beginning the adherence rate was about 70 percent, and going into the, about November or so, uh, most people have fallen down to 50, 60 percent, and you only take a few to really spread uh, the virus itself. And also, we have come to learn that the virus spreading are mostly coming from uh, a lot of asymptomatics uh, or mildly symptomatic individual that accounts more than 50, 60 percent. Yeah. And so through family gathering, although everybody wear a mask and however, when you go home, when you go eat, the mask is down. Mm -hmm. Those are the times that when we start to see the spikes uh, through family gathering and events yes. as yes. such. And so that that that's still um, we will be going through this for uh, probably an upcoming months, if not the entire year. I don't want to be pessimistic, <laughs> but at the same time, uh, cautious, even though I, I got my vaccine shots already, mm -hmm. uh, both both of them. But at the same time, I feel that the community as a whole, uh, unfortunately, we will have to reach that. 60 to 80 percent vaccine herd immunity yeah. um, to attain that. Let me ask you a quick question. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned that you've taken both of your vaccines, but when we look at what's happening, perhaps in the United States or other parts of the world, there are persons who are naturally fearful of being given a vaccine shot, notwithstanding the fact that we are faced with a very serious pandemic where perhaps being vaccinated is the way to go to prevent um, having to deal with this crisis situation going forward. What do you believe is perhaps one of the reasons or per, may, maybe the main reason why people in the United States are um, objecting to being vaccinated? I, I think it's, uh, it's a, a 
personal, religious, but also uh, information. A lot of people offer and amplify the information as such that they think the few cases of severe reaction applies to everybody. Mm -hmm. But in fact, that's not true. Um, currently, we've seen over 40 million doses has been given and severe reaction is probably uh, less than a dozen. Um, so in that in that setting, for example, in, in my hospital, we have delivered over uh, 65,000 doses already. Mm -hmm. 65,000 people have received the doses, and we only have a few cases of allergic reactions, but none has undergone, uh, has required really to be hospitalized for um, severe allergic reactions. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we, um, we were very comfortable and all of my staff are vaccinated and everybody's back at work already. So um, I think it's information, it's education, and this is not new. Uh, this has been going on since the pand since previous pandemics, mm -hmm. um, since every even regular vaccines that we see in, in kids, adults, and, and so forth that um, that has been um, compromising a lot. But uh, ultimately, it, it it comes down to that um, it's a small percentage. Uh, it's really down to the regulations. Um, for example, like flu vaccine that we have to get every season, mm -hmm. um, it comes down to as a mandate by the by your jobs. So really, when it, when it becomes as such, then it becomes normalized uh, practice that everybody gets to have, um, and it takes the fear away uh, for the most part. Doctor Su, tell us a bit about uh, the work that you have been doing there. I, I know at the start of January. Um, the biggest concern, uh, and it was in many states, but especially in Texas as well, was that you would reach your capacity or beyond your capacity for hospitalizations. You work directly in the ICU. Um, and tell us about what, his, what it has been like being on the ground. Uh, yes. So if I may, I will want to share a, a sure. video um, which has been done by uh, New York Times that, uh, st that was stationed within our ICU for about a month. Uh, hopefully you can see this first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can happen to me. So this is a lady that has been hospitalized hey. who, was not, wow. uh, who, who did not believe in the... Karina, uh, can you get some leads? Um, so she was going about and doing her own business. However, she contracted the virus. What have I learned? Here is what our staff the really all geared up in helping her. She was intubated. The value she of requires family. to be uh, Very nice. uh, doing, We're going through these what we call prone today. positioning. Don't That's why worry, she was okay? rubbed like a burrito. You leave it. And uh, her and it's her true. let her sleep on her belly. Yeah. Uh, luckily, oh. she survived. Oh. She told the story. The tube came out. Again. Um, she was able to go in. None of us or invincible. So these are just a glimpse of, yeah. of, I guess of patients part of and for her to come and tell her story that this is real. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and next, uh, I actually <laughs> have uh, some some slides I want to share uh, just to kind of recap what we were going through. Yeah. So this is sort of uh, back in um, March, end of March, within a few weeks uh, when our ICU opens up that the United States break uh, number one in the world and that continues to unfortunately now we're uh, occupying about a quarter of all the cases in the world meanwhile belize as a whole saw this uh i think believe is one in 30 uh, close to one in 30 uh in the populations so a little, a little bit less than the united states but i think as a whole we're all approaching a, a, a scary numbers mm -hmm. and here is some of the picture in our icus we we had to convert a lot of our ICU rooms to negative pressures, and we're using a lot of resources. As you can see on the right-hand side, this is what we call ECMO machines, where my colleagues are doing um, cleaning of a patient's lung. Uh, luckily, this patient survived, but it's the amount of resources that has to go in to really um, take care of these patients. And here's an example of what an ICU, I, probably you, most people don't have a chance to see this, so you see glimpse on TV, but these are the machines that we, we really pull outside to, um, so we could reduce our PPE use. But this, this guy, for example, require ventilator, dialysis, multiple medications and drips, and also uh, very expensive nitrogen gas to help open up the lungs. 
And it's, despite of all this, his heart stops and we have to use automated CPR machines and shock devices to simply keep him alive. And what we have seen is about one in five uh, hospitalized patients ends up in the ICU. And the mortality overall is about a third. Despite of all these resources, we're talking about 35% or so. And for those who's intubated, about 51% uh, did not make it. And as age goes up, this number goes up, mm. which is quite, quite um, distraught for us. Yeah. Those are some really uh, startling numbers. I know when we think of, of uh, the resources that you have available there, naturally, for us here at home, we're saying, do we even have <laughs> access to all, of, uh, to all of the technology and also to the, to the resources, both physical and human? Dr. Sue, I know, and I, I wanted to get this in early. You worked here in Belize um, before yes. you went off to specialize. You were at the KHMH, so you're very well acquainted. And I know your colleagues here keep in touch with you as well. Um, so yes. you're very well acquainted with the situation on the ground. As you started to see the pandemic unfolding in Houston, um, in your hospital, and you saw the severity of the illness and the amount of treatment required for hospitalized patients, what were your thoughts of Belize at that time? Um, one thing I, I immediately, the Ministry of Health uh, reached out and we have set up uh, meetings and, and, and sort of um, educational sessions for our staff uh, right away. So all the, the health professionals and, and medical officers across the country were able to have a conversation and understand what's on the ground and share uh, sort of my experience here on the ground here in Houston and understanding that the resource has been quite limited. Um, and I really have to uh, give a pause to the ministry and, and all, all the hospital system to really come together with the limited resource to put what we have in place uh, in terms of treatment management and the plan that's devised. Uh, even at one point I felt the PPE in Belize is better than what I have in Houston. Um, uh, with the amount of um, things that were taken into account to take care of the sickest patients, um, it, it's really hard. And I think there's really no easy way out. Um, it, even here, we have to put all the resources together, pull extra people, hire extra people with the traveling nurses and doctors to really just help out even as big as a system that we have. So um, I, I, really, uh, I really have to applaud the, the, my colleagues in Belize now um, is pulling this through. And, and for example, Dr. Pedro Arriaga, a KHMH, and, and Jorge Dalgo, uh, B, BHPL. So um, we are, we, we're in constant conversation. And really, um, I felt this, that the number in Belize is not that far off in terms of, uh, in terms of the rates, the mortality, and so forth, uh, even compared to the United States. So it often brings me the question as to, um, it, it, you know, the things that we're doing here, are we making patients better? So it, it's, it, it's a difficult conversation to have, yeah. yes. Let me, let me go in a slightly different direction here, just to, to get your personal take as well. You are a frontline worker. You are exposed to people who are afflicted with COVID-19 on a daily basis. What has been your personal view in terms of the work that you are doing and seeing these persons who are coming in sick and having to deal with them, knowing that you yourself are putting, you're putting your, your, your life on the line, so to speak? Yes, um, it has been very scary because at, at the very beginning, I remember the first day, first patient that we have, uh, as I was going into the, the hospital, I, I felt I'm walking into a war zone, knowing that I have to wear PPE, wear N95 mask, and, and that puts an extra layer of mental stress. Mm -hmm. and, and as we churning through this and knowing how sick these people are and that they cannot see their family, their family could not come in to see them, uh, and, and even for me and my family, I always constantly worry that I would give this to my family as well. Um, that added a lot of mental anguish to, to not just the physical threat that we have. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, so far, we're all doing okay. Um, so, which means that the PPE uh, and the practice that we have, you know, going home, I set out a dirty zone in the garage. 
uh, and then to protect my family from that, I uh, sanitize and, and spray everything down, for example, and those seem to work. Mm -hmm. But um, it, this takes a big toll, and, and there are studies now looking, for, not just from China, from across the world, that the uh, all uh, more than half of um, healthcare workers do come down with some degree of uh, PTSD, or fatigue, uh, and also just pandemic fatigue in general. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think both, this will take a lot of time uh, after the pandemic to really come to realize uh, how much how much and how deep we are affected by it. Pandemic fatigue. I, one, I, right? I think that's one that we all feel. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting when you speak of it from a physician's perspective. Um, it's been for some countries, I know for, for the US, for example, over a year, we were just, we didn't get our first case until March, so we didn't start facing restrictions and lockdowns till then. Um, but we have all been talking about COVID-19 since this time last year. What happens is that when we have this fatigue is that we let our guard down. You know, the hypervigilance of talking about uh, how long to wash your hands, how often to wash your hands, how um, snug your mask should be. Those conversations have long passed. What do you think is, is, is in this year too? Um, are some of the ways that we can kind of keep that sense of urgency for protection? We don't have access to the vaccine as yet. It will come, but just not right now. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? I think it has to be a multiple at multiple level preparation. So um, at the at the higher level ups, you have a, a plan. As you can see, how the vaccine has been rolled out in the United States, uh, it's a, it looks it sounds good, but it kind of fumbles and, and mumbles through uh, compared with, for example, um, Israel or UAE, where now they have um, almost forty percent approaching 40% of the population been vaccinated. And they, they seem, and the effect is very tremendous. They're seeing about 60% drop in their cases so far. So that is a bigger planning ahead of the year. Once you have a vaccine, you want to deploy, we want to get that in people's arm. Yeah. And as a, as a country, as a, for the general public, is to um, stay vigilant, find, navigate ways to, to go around, but meanwhile, still maintaining uh, these adherents um, to avoid the, to avoid um, contracting the disease, as we know that it's mutating, um, it, and it will only happen more if we allow more cases to occur. Um, and so this is one of those where, um, unfortunately, you only realize how bad it is when it hits you or your family. So I think um, uh, having the uh, having the ability to see what's going on inside the hospital. Uh, does provide some insights. Um, that's why I felt um, what our hospital is trying to do is to share that information. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, often at times, it also becomes quite difficult because uh, folks have not been able to, even if they see it, but it they always feels like it's a very distant story. So I think, you know, uh, reiterations uh, and also reassurance yeah. to, to the public, um, that's one thing. And of course, you know, legally, to 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 um and to kind of put this together it will be quite difficult because there are economic challenges and so forth. So really have to come as a country to have a, a common goal um, where we are seeing in the United States it's pretty fragmented and we're seeing a lot of uh, folks running around uh, and behave as it doesn't as this is not real. And, and it, now come to think if you would sit in a very packed restaurant or airplane. It looks like a scene out of a horror movie, mm -hmm. um, and, and even so, that that's why it's very so hard. And uh, me being on the front line, knowing this, um, it's even worse. So I think it's just have to come together to realize how to navigate and form our own uh, new lifestyle because this will not go away anytime soon. And they could always become seasonal. It could come back. Uh, it could become part of the flu, uh, similar to the flu pandemic in terms of the way it comes and waves and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I think um, it, that 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 would be sort of a general directions. Unfortunately, vague, uh, but we all have to navigate it together. Yeah. And when you talk about uh, the patients that you've seen, you know, because the information has been so widespread talking about the high risk populations, the elderly, the obese, the people with um, 
conditions like diabetes, hypertension, uh, or those who have a suppressed Im immune system. It oftentimes kind of separates society and we think, well, I don't fit any of that criteria, so I'm okay. But the data clearly shows that people, even who are young, healthy, um, and who you thought were less predisposed actually get severe symptoms as well and end up in the hospital. Do you want to share that experience as well? Yeah, so uh, one, this is very interesting because back in March when we have our first wave of uh, critical ill patients coming in, we immediately went from two, four, and with the pack 24 beds, ultimately 60 beds, uh, in the first wave, and now we're doing the same thing in the third wave. And when it was happening, uh, we were only learning the data from China about these comorbidities. But then when it comes to Texas and now across the world, we start to realize a lot of young folks who's obese um, and, and who has um, a lot of comorbidities as well. But they're generally, um, especially also racial predilection. So in, in Houston, for example, we have about uh, Forty percent Hispanic populations, but uh, disproportionately, our patients uh, that's affected by about are at least sixty percent Hispanics. So when we saw that, it was uh, sort of alarming as to why. And, and until this day, it's still uh, quite blur as to why this is happening. But at the same time, a lot of cultural practices, uh, multi generational family, mm -hmm. um, and, and sort of a lack of adherence to guidelines and so forth. So um, when we start seeing these young folks and obese folks that they thought they're impervious to it, that's affected by it, uh, we immediately want to reach out to the community and let them know uh, in terms of the, the practices. But unfortunately, um, that trend is still ongoing. The young folks now, what I'm seeing from first wave to third wave is that the young folks end up less in the ICUs, but a lot of their uh, loved ones uh, their their parents or their grandparents end up in the ICUs. And it's disheartening to say because uh, we would, uh, for example, have a couple um, in the ICU where we who's intubated, who cannot make decision for themselves, mm -hmm. and we have to call their family. And very often their family actually are in another hospital rooms, uh, suffering on their own and making decisions for their parents, or they're recovering from it, or they are dealing with another death in the family. Yeah. Um, and, and you realize that uh, one question I always like to ask them is, uh, how did you get it? Um, at the beginning, everybody would tell me they travel, they, they got it from work. And then the third wave, some of them becomes a bit shy about why. And, and I feel a lot of it becomes a guilt. Um, they felt like, oh, I went out to eat and I went to visit my parents. Uh, and it becomes a guilt. It becomes a mental anguish to them because they feel they're the one that's been spreading and it didn't hit them until it really happens. So, so I think that's sort of the, the changes and waves and shifts that, that, uh, that we were seeing, um, not just how sick uh, someone who's, who is, but how the, the dynamic have changed in terms of the patient characteristics. Yeah. yeah. When you, when you look at the fact that for instance, as you're describing the third wave, um, people, feel the need to cluster as families because you still, you, you still have it in the back of your mind. You, well, you know, I need to go and see my mom or my dad or uh, my brother or someone, some relative. I think part of the issue is at the moment is that we've gotten to a point where we're exhausted of, of having to remain at home or in isolation or having to abide by certain guidelines and we're just seeking that freedom, even if it's just a little bit to be able to go back to perhaps how things were before the pandemic? Do you feel like that is part of the issue why we're seeing that third wave and the characteristics of it as you described? Um, very much so. And as you realize, um, November throughout the winter time, there are multiple events happening, um, especially around where I live, um, you know, in terms of the political wave change, in terms of family gathering, and then there's back to back Thanksgiving, Christmas, uh, very close to each other. So, and you start to see travels uh, becomes very lax. The airlines start to fly more. Yeah. And so uh, the, again, coming back to the pandemic fatigue, uh, it kind of just um, really obliterated the scare and the fear because a lot of it, when you come down and, and 
folks would feel like, oh, I'm so sick and tired of this. So yeah. I, let me just go ahead and, and go back because I don't feel anything. But unfortunately, when that happens, it doesn't hit everybody. Mm. Uh, most people do fine, but then you have small clusters and it just continues and the clocks keeps getting reset. And so it, it becomes, uh, as a community, most people do okay. As I, as I mentioned, you know, 50 to 70% do adhere to the guideline, but then you have 30 to 40% that does not. So then the pandemic keeps going on. And I often joke and half joke that, you know, um, when it comes to religious belief that our, our belief really got put to test, you know, how obedient can you be? How disciplined can you be? And each time you only need uh, a small, small gap or small lack and it will hit you really hard. And unfortunately that's what we're seeing. Uh, and that's why it's important to have a bigger plan in terms of herd immunity, uh, in terms of vaccination to come and achieve so that uh, sooner than later, um, we could all move on and, and leave this behind. Yeah. All right, well, what we're going to do right now is uh, take a quick pause in the conversation. We do have more to discuss, of course, looking at what we know now about treatment and the importance of uh, testing. So we're going to tackle those topics in just a few. We'll take a quick commercial break, and we'll be back shortly. For over 20 years, Great Belize Television, Channel 5, has been the leader in award-winning local programming. We have also produced some of the best video commercials, documentaries, and live events for clients countrywide. And we continue to offer high-quality production services to maximize your advertising needs for your business or organization. From concept to completion, let us help you achieve your marketing goal by producing your commercial, documentary, graphic animation, live event, or even designing your website. Using state-of-the-art equipment and experienced personnel, we can make your ideas come alive. For more information, come see us on Coney Drive or give us a call at 223-0146 or 223-7781 or email us at gbtv at btl.net. Great Belize Productions, making great television in Belize. We're back, and if you're just joining us, we are continuing with our COVID-19 update for today. We're joined by ICU physician at Houston at Methodist Hospital, Dr. Stephen Sue, and uh, we've been talking about his uh, experience in Houston in treating uh, patients with COVID-19 for the past year. And now we're going to uh, shift and talk a bit about uh, the disease itself and some of the things that we have learned. Dr. Sue, when you first started getting patients in the ICU. It was a new disease. And so learning to treat it uh, has been something that I think we've all been uh, hearing the experience as you go along. From what we knew in January 2020 to what we know now, what has been the biggest uh, lesson or information that we've learned about COVID-19 that has impacted treatment and the survival rate? Yes, so um, I think one of the biggest lessons that we have learned is the uh, to stay calm. Um, the, the reason <laughs> I said that is at the very beginning, we get so much information uh, and disinformation as competing each other, uh, which I, we call it infodemics, not just pandemic, but infodemics. And because of all these information, we, we really don't know what to do. So back in March last year, uh, we, we, at the beginning, we were scrambling. We really are scrambling. We were using all the medication that you could hear. Uh, you hear about the anti-HAV medications, the hydroxychloroquine, uh, and we're using, uh, we're using it all at once. And I'm looking back at those, the patients we have back then, they re have received everything. Uh, until now, those have been disbanded or disproved. Uh, whereby more evidence are accumulating throughout the years and we re throughout the whole year and we realized that uh, none of it works and not the way we wanted it.
But one of the important key things that we we have gotten out of this is that the how rapidly improving the the, the biomedical technologies uh, in terms of the way a lot of drugs are producing. We went from um, using those medications, uh, hydroxychloroquine and so forth, to now using something called monoclonal antibodies. Uh, these are purified forms of, uh, of medication that goes targeted against the uh, virus from binding into the cells. So uh, the, it, it's not like the regular drugs that you could find a compound and just make it in the mass production. These has to grow in a lab and it takes time. And even at, at the current capacity um, in the United States could only produce about half a million doses a year. So um, that's one aspect where I think has still slowly come to form. Yeah. And second is the plasma. And as we have heard, uh, unfortunately, uh, our uh, beloved colleagues in Belize, Dr. Guerra uh, brothers, uh, uh, during the, the, their, their um, uh, critical states, that there was a call for plasma from recovered patients. So back in March, we, we started the program along with Mayo Clinic. Uh, and we actually deliver the first plasma uh, in the United States. And what we have found is that these things work similarly to, uh, to the antibodies, uh, which we are counted uh, the antibody that's made by the recovered patients. Mm -hmm. And we realized that it has to be a very, very high concentration for it to work. Um, and it has to be given very, very early uh, since the symptom onset, rather than when they're sick in the ICU. So the, the third, the shift, the gear has started to shift it, uh, moving towards the treat patients much earlier, even at outpatients. Um, instead of waiting home and getting Tylenol, when you start to have symptoms like fever, uh, shortness of breath or, or cough, or uh, even needing just a little oxygen, that is the time to, to be aggressive to treat. And it's similar to uh, what we've seen, like influenza, for example, you have to take the Tamiflu within 48 hours. Um, so the same idea applies to COVID. The earlier you do it, the better the outcome is, especially those who um, is in between. So 80% of COVID patients do recover without interventions. And there are 10 to 15 that becomes moderate to severe. And those are the, the group that we want to target so they don't become uh, critically ill. Uh, and what we have seen is that we, uh, for all these studies, like, and especially like remdesivir that you heard about the antivirals, um, those stays, but um, it, it helps those who was moderate to become mild, but the severe ones are there to stay. We still see that 5% or so of the people becoming critically ill. Mm -hmm. So early intervention is the key. And of course, the larger picture is to prevent for it from happening. And even the difference between when it was first thought to just be a respiratory illness to now the list of uh, symptoms has expanded to, to so many other um, types of illnesses? Yes, so it, it, it's actually more of a systemic disease yeah. and it started out in the lungs, but then uh, the, the, the viral replication phase happened within the first week. And so it, it, I always take this like flood. So when the flood comes and hits your house, um, that's when you want to block the water from coming in. So that's when the virus are attacking and replicating. But once the virus dies down, the, the, it's the, the aftermath, the broken down, the mold, the mm. infestations, uh, where the house starts to crumble. There's no more water, but then there is uh, other problems. And it kind of happens in the bodies too. So you start to see, um, for example, we call, I call COVID brain, where at a, it could be a viral component, but it's also a metabolic component. These patients are very, very difficult to sedate very, very difficult to wake up. And we have seen a slew of uh, manifestations such as seizure, uh, stroke, uh, bleeding in the brain uh, uh, as a consequence of this. And a lot, about a quarter of our patients uh, develop um, kidney failures that require dialysis. And we have seen a lot of uh, skin manifestations, neuromuscular weakness, uh, gastrointestinal bleeding, and so just the spew of complications. And uh, one big part is the infection, secondary infection. So one of the treatments that um, we are using a lot more is steroids, yeah. and which is a, cheap, a pretty cheap alternative and it's pretty effective. But at the same time, it suppresses your immune system uh, when you receive it for a long time. Mm. So we start to see a lot of secondary bacteria, 
fungus infections. And so that's when the house broke down and you have mold, you have other things that grows and that continue to ravage um, the body. Yeah. Yeah. We slowly are beginning to hear stories of people who have uh, what they call long COVID um, mm -hmm. yeah, with the, the effects that linger for so long after. Let's yes. shift focus now, though, and talk about, I know you have, you, you said very early on that uh, the medical community in Belize reached out to you immediately because they knew you were working in Houston. Um, and you've been providing um, training and education to the medical community here. Let's talk about the strategy that Belize has employed so far and your thoughts on it. Um, I, I have to say that I have to applaud uh, the country as a whole to really put together uh, the, the resources that we have um, to make it happen. And I, I think as much as folks might want to think that is not enough, which I think uh, we really, uh, in terms of the strategy that the government have put in place, the curfew, uh, the semi-lockdowns that we've seen, um, it really has, it has trying to achieve what it does and limited the spread. So on the community as a whole, I know there are, are, are you know, people who's not going to adhere to this, but the enforcements that we're seeing, uh, for example, the, the, to the extreme where the mask event that you, you guys were talking yeah. about earlier, um, it, it also goes to show how, how serious that um, our public and our uh, officials have take, uh, taken this into account. Mm -hmm. And Belize really have uh, very little reserve to be compromised. Uh, especially with the wider spread. Um, second is that uh, for the community level, we're a little bit fortunate in the sense that, as I mentioned, more than 80% of the people do recover fine. So it has not, uh, it, it is overloading to, to the system, but the system currently is holding on to it. And, and the resources, and again, as I mentioned, the PPE that I'm seeing, uh, my colleagues that's wearing uh, probably is more than what I have in Houston, uh, it's also reassuring that uh, that they are, many, many are protected. Um, we do see, of course, uh, health uh, healthcare providers are, are being infected by it as well. And it really comes down to you know uh, not just what you get from work, but also at home, especially when you have a community spread as such that um, a lot of half of the chance is coming from home and not just from work. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it really. Um, boggles down to, to um, how we adhere in, in these guidelines. So I feel Belize has done a great job in reinforcing the guidelines so far. Uh, as much as we wanted to see it work, um, it just takes time and patience. And, and really, I think um, uh, our folks has done probably a better job than, than, than many here um, in the United States. What are some of the, the recommendations that you uh, make to enhance uh, our system. I mean, one of the things that we know uh, is that we are not sure whether or not we have uh, the new variants of the COVID-19 as yet. We've sent some samples off to Baylor and, and CARFA, but we haven't gotten the results as yet. Um, many people in the medical community say, well, it's not if, it's when. Um, put that into perspective with, with some recommendations. So with, with the new variants, it's what we call selective pressure. So when you have so many cases, it's bound to change. And it's very it's uh, putting in what I call the Serengeti rules of life. Uh, what happens at the virus level happens at the community level. So imagine you, you're trying to oppress a group of folks and they will evolve and change. So same thing with the virus. Yeah. So um, one of the things that it will find its way, it, it's life, it will find its way to adapt, it finds its way to, to be better at what it does, which is to spread the infections. And so I, I, for humans, we know it comes from uh, contact, from air, from air, from droplets, from aerosols, and all this. So the, the prevention guidelines will stay the same. And this is what I uh, recognize as the hierarchy of control. When we come talking about PPE and treatments, that's the release effective in targeting the virus. And we have to move one step up to really talk about eliminations. And, and this is really to prevent and eliminate, no matter how what variant it is. And it's really, if you stop at the level of spreading, um, it, it doesn't it doesn't go further. So, and it limits this um, chance of become more resistant and developing new strains. Yeah. So it really is a true test to humanity 
uh, as it is, um, how much can we uh, can we um, stand to it? So uh, bottom line is, you know, keep those guidelines and, and follow those guidelines. Um, and it, it really takes patience. And hopefully in the next six to nine months, where, and as Belize have the ability to, to deliver the vaccine, uh, later later in the year uh, that the community as a whole to also um, educated about the vaccine to be prepared of what's coming and to be ready to give it and to be ready to receive it. Yeah. And you, you spoke earlier of the convalescent plasma from recovered patients. Um, so this is something that you said needs to be administered very early. Have you communicated with uh, the, the ICU specialists here about uh, the use of the plasma and how it's been going? I know that blood donations are, are usually difficult in Belize in general. Yes, so um, what at the very beginning I did try to uh, have our, uh, the primary investigator with the plasma uh, to, to reach out to our folks in Belize. However, the technicality um, in terms of the donation, not just that, but the testing. So you will have to test the plasma itself to ensure the uh, the titer or the concentration of the um, antibody has to be sufficient and high enough to work. So unfortunately, that that even at the very beginning, we did not have the ability to test that until recent. So uh, that has to be, the, the, in Belize, if the lab has that uh, ability to do it, then it, ma it makes it more, uh, efficient and, and, and available. But if you don't have that ability to do so, then very often we end up finding is we're giving these plasma, but they have either no antibodies or they have very low antibodies. That's and also the patient who already exposed to COVID previously. So we also seen a wave of patient who has antibody develop in the bodies. Um, these plasma would not work. So right now, one of the contraindications to give the plasma is someone who has antibody already. Yeah. So um, it really comes down to the ability for the laboratory to test both ends for this to really become a, an option. Do you and even know then, so go ahead. I was going to ask if you know when there is the highest concentration of antibodies in the system. Is it immediately after recovery, a month later, two months later? Um, so it varies, it depends on the exposure. So uh, we noticed that only a small fraction of, uh, of the recovered patient carries the high titers and high concentrations. And it kind of started to go away as time goes by. We're talking about maybe uh, the height usually is about one to two weeks. So our, our programs recommend that donation happens when you recover from the virus in about two weeks time. And as time goes by, that number start to go down. Interesting. So um, it, there is a time from the donations also for the time to receive by the patients as well. Yeah. Now, as you face the second uh, capacity um, situation at your hospital, um, you know, the US is in their third wave. We are starting to see what was a spike um, start to, to calm down a bit. And we are cautiously optimistic. But what's, what's been the recommendation that you've made um, to handle the, the health care and the treatment when a hospital or the hospital care reaches capacity? We have limited resources. And I know one of the things that um, the health professionals have consistently talked about is you can't just look at beds. You have to look at the people who are who are available to man those beds as well. So it, it was a uh, or has been a growing frustration for for us. For example, in Texas Medical Centers, we treated close to fifty thousand patients uh, since the pandemic, and the ICU beds are about uh, fifteen hundred total, and that's a lot of beds. But um, there is a lot of sick normal. Uh, sick patients other than COVID. So uh, at, the, at the peak of it, more than half of it was occupied by COVID. Um, however, the public was learning, what the public was learning that we have the capacity to expand. You could turn the whole hospital into COVID, but do you have the ability to take care of these um, uh, sick patients? And uh, from experience, we have learned that uh, it's not the same. You have a regular floor uh, nurse who might not be able to take care of the, the ICUs. So um, although there is a bed, uh, there is no people to man it. So it looks good on the paper, but it's not good on the ground. Mm 
uh, and that's why we had to hire traveling nurses. We had to hire traveling doctors that goes around the, the, the country really to different pockets of epicenter. And once they stay, they stay for a couple months until it dies down. And you end up losing a lot of money uh, because of that. So um, oh, one of the things, <laughs> go ahead. How effective has that been in terms of introducing the idea of traveling doctors and nurses? It, it was, it's short, it surely provides some relief to the system. It, it, it allows the hospitals to, to still operate at a certain level. So one of the approach that you could see difference in the countries, for example, China, they have dedicated uh, entire hospital to COVID or entire section to COVID, but we don't have that luxury because we still have to take care of the regular patients mm -hmm. uh, with cancer, with heart diseases, for example, um, those do not stop. So we have to make sure that our, our nurses and, and doctors don't get diverted away from those, re those areas. So when the capacity allows, we use uh, those extra manpower to really go in and help in those areas. Meanwhile, trying to still maintain some degree of normal operations. Um, and so it did provide the, the short relief. However, um, uh, from a personal level, it becomes more um, challenging because you don't know who you're dealing with. Um, the the, the, the um, staff might not be familiar with the system. So it creates a lot of learning curve and chaos at the very beginning uh, for us as well. Now, I'm, I'm sure, as I said earlier, you keep in touch with your colleagues here. Um, and having, having worked within the hospitals, what you've seen that we've been able to create with the COVID-19 unit in, in getting people, uh, I know we report on the deaths, but there's so many people who actually get released from uh, ICU care as well, um, and having been successfully treated for COVID. Uh, what are your thoughts when you know what they have been able to do with the resources that you know exist? I'm very proud. I'm very proud of, of what we're able to achieve in Belize uh, with the limited beds that we have. Um, as I was in contact with Dr. Ariaga, for example, uh, yesterday to learn about the numbers that they have and the uh, the mortality, I'm actually very uh, I'm in awe to to know that the number is not very far off from what we are seeing here in the United States. So I think, you know, folks on the grounds really put their heart and soul into working and make sure that it works. And, and so that's the same mentality that I have and I have taken away uh, as a medical officer from Carl Huchner, uh working at a and &E back then. And so I felt that spirit has stayed and that it really carries on uh, as a whole. It's more than just a job or career, but it's a mission to, to safeguard the country to make sure that it works. So I think uh, Belize has, has really adapted and has really taken on a difficult task uh, during the pandemic to make it happen. So I, I think um, I have to really applaud to, um, to, to my colleagues to, to, in Belize that it, that to make it work. Yeah. And as we uh, start to see people clamoring for loosening of restrictions and um, being able to have a bit more freedom, uh, what are your um, what are some of the things that you would hope we'd consider? Uh, it's scary because we don't know when uh, when that can come about oh, the normalcy. That's something I pray for 2021 is to return to some sense of normalcy. But um, it, we are still far from that. So but when the when they start to return, I think we have to be cautiously optimistic, as you mentioned. Um, to open up slowly because we've seen that happen the last time when we open up and the, then the cases rises. So it really comes down to we have to see what's going on around the world, especially Belize uh, rely heavily on tourism and for folks and imports to come in. Uh, then really it's until all the cases around the world are subsiding and when the immunity and so on uh, has achieved, then really opening the border, really opening up back to normalcy is more uh, safeguarded. Yeah. But while we're entering that phase, we have to still take the same precautions, which we know is working. We know the mask, we know the physical distance, the hand hygiene. And if you're sick, please avoid uh, visiting. And those measures stays and it will stay until really we reach that goal together. Well, Dr. Sue, we do appreciate you uh, sharing your experience with us this morning. 
um, and uh, talking a bit about what you have seen there and your thoughts on what's happening here in Belize. Thank you, Marlene. Thank you, Zani. It's All a pleasure. Right. Okay, and stay safe. You too. And that's it for us uh, with our COVID-19 update for today. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to be talking about how to stay motivated. And so that's coming up in a few. Please stay tuned. This COVID update was brought to you by Foltex Systems, your technology center, where you'll come for the price, but stay for the service. <laughs>